Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to our first webinar of our biological webinar series here at Green Cover. Um, a few directions for today's webinar. Everyone will be muted, and if you have questions, you can click on the Q&A button to type in your questions. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of Doug's uh, speech. And if you have any other additional questions, you can certainly email us. Also, this presentation will be recorded and posted on our YouTube page. For today's topic, uh, we will be discussing our Rhizofixer Plus inoculant. This is a great inoculant that we've added and are very excited to use it on our seed due to the long seed life up to 60 days from the time it is mixed. In addition to long, the long seed life and rhizobia for legumes, it also offers high levels of asospirillum. That is a free living nitrogen fixing bacteria to help non-legume plants provide nitrogen to the soil. Along with the nitrogen fixing bacteria, Benefits, this product has the ability to solubilize phosphorus in the soil, making it available to the plant. With us today to go more in depth about this product is Doug Kramer. Doug is the founder and CEO of Terramax. He is the brains behind the science of this product. With his role, he participates and directs research related with microbial survival and applications of specific microbial functions. He leads the charge with designing and implement implementation of Terramax's product lineup along with managing the organization. A little history on Doug's professional experience is related to the topics of plant cell biology, genetic modification of plants, and microbial formulations and applications to plants. Doug has 40 plus years of active research and application to the field of these concepts. This includes time at the University of Minnesota, a startup for molecular biology, molecular genetics, BioSeeds International, consulting on formulations for microorganisms, and the last 25 years on the finding and running of Terramax. So with that, Doug, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Dylan. It, it always sounds a little more flowery than the experience may have been, guys. <laughs> uh, pleasure to speak with everyone today. Uh, hopefully I have some information that uh, you will find useful as well as interesting. And, and they don't always go together in science. <laughs> they can be useful. And I want to thank Green Cover, Keith, and all uh, Dylan, Jonathan, all, all the folks there uh, for inviting me to share this. So uh, hopefully, again, we have some information that, that will, will uh, be interesting to you and that you can find to help understand some of these things. Uh, uh, microbiological products, I don't have to tell anybody, are, are really uh, taking, uh, they're on stage, and they may in fact be center stage. Uh, problems are, there's lots of folks who want to, to let us know how much they know, and I can tell you that from my perspective personally, uh, I'm excited because there's lots to learn. And, and we, are, we are learning that, we are teaching ourselves, and there's a lot of good people doing a lot of work. Uh, so with that, uh, I wanna kick this off. And uh, today I wanna give you a brief overview of Terramax uh, uh, people and, and kind of philosophies, if you will. Uh, I wanna cover a little bit on what we call the stabilization which is what the process we use to improve survivability and gives us some of those long on seed capabilities as well as just survival capabilities. And I'll get more into that. I have a brief section on kind of soils and microorganisms, a little bit of, of how those interact and play and really with the focus on microorganisms. Uh, touch on biological nitrogen fixation, uh, or BNF, which uh, encompasses everything from the leguminous inoculants, soybeans, uh, cow peas, uh, the you know, field peas, those kind, of, those kind of situations, as well as the associative types such as azospirillum uh, that Dylan touched on. Uh, the our approach to the phosphorus, and I want to show you a little bit about that. And then we end with a couple of uh, label shots, if you will, of Rhizofixer Plus, which for green cover, we put together the, this mixture. Uh, and so hopefully I give you the flavor of the company, 
the technology and some of the things we have done using those. So uh, started Terramax in 1998. We have entered our 25th year. Uh, we don't want to be over, overly proud of that, but, uh, but we're, we're, we've made it to our 25th year, and that's something we're, we're kind of proud of. In the backdrop of this slide, that is our facility uh, currently, uh, and um, so we're focused on plant performance with microbial products. This includes nutritional as well as we have some efforts into uh, biocontrol, uh, which is something we started the company with, but uh, we've had enough on our plate with just nutritional. And I'm really happy personally to say we're getting back into that biocontrol uh, uh, realm as well. <clears throat> we uh, make products for both the conventional and the organic markets. Uh, that may seem like an easy thing to do, and I can tell you, having experienced it, it's not. The, the requirements for organic approval uh, are, are real, and, and they encompass not only the compounds you use, but how those compounds or, and or products or some things you're using may have been made. So, um, and we, again, we, we talk about stabilization. Uh, we are well-founded in science. And I got to tell you, science doesn't answer everything. And uh, there's, I'll paraphrase uh, uh, a guy that, uh, that I've quoted before. And that is, um, uh, he, he said that science is a great tool. With it, we can prove many things. But life is complex. Get over it. So in other words, we're able to demonstrate certain things using the tenets of science, but a lot of, of what we see, what we talk about is stuff that you people have seen, that you people share with us, and they can be puzzles and we can make guesses. So, but we work very hard to make sure that what we release as products have been trialed, have been understood and, and as well as we can, and we think that's the right thing to do. Uh, we've been selling inoculants for plants since about 2000. Uh, these include everything from uh, Brady rhizobium for soybeans to other leguminous inoculants to uh, azospirillum. Again, that, that's a class of microbe called associative mainly. And uh, you know, we've been at this business as a commercial production facility, as well as a research facility since our inception. Uh, there's the building again, it's 37,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet of laboratory. Our offices are there, the production is there, our warehouse is there. We've built a strong science team, uh, including PhDs, master's level and bachelor's level scientists. Uh, not everybody in our organization is a degreed individual. Uh, that, that kind of tilts the flavor, if you will, of the organization. So I like to encourage having a well-rounded team. But often when you talk science, those letters are what means something to people. And they do carry some weight. And we are fortunate to have good quality people, good human beings, as well as good quality scientists involved with us. Our proprietary stabilization technology has really allowed us to create these kind of products. And I would say reliably create them because in our business of agriculture and growing plants, one of our biggest challenges is how to consistently elicit the responses that we would like, whether they be from microbes and fixing atmospheric nitrogen or just growing the plants and trying to get the yields to where we believe they should be, uh, you know, in terms of cover crops, what, what are the expectations there? So uh, the stabilization has allowed us to reliably do these things and use them as seed treatments, as well as, as various types of broadcast and furrow. Uh, those, those kind of things. And that's specifically with the microorganisms. Uh, kind of 
four of our founding principles, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I bring it up all the time. And some of it may seem silly, but I guarantee you it's not silly. It is that uh, function first. What we put in a container and sell to people, we have to have shown that it does something, that it works. So that is the bottom line issue for us at Terramax. And again, sound science, that when we do field trials, that we follow the appropriate methodologies for testing. So controls, randomization, those kind of things. Uh, we don't use uh, statistics everywhere in our business, but you can use the framework of statistics. And what I mean by that is, again, the experimental design. If you want to see if something behaves differently in your field, you need to have a control. You need to compare it to something. So, uh, and you might be surprised at how often that part is passed over. Um, <clears throat> another tenet of us, uh, of our company, is that we integrate with existing use practices. Uh, this, is, this is up there because early in my career when I was doing things, I wasn't sure how a farmer might use. It became very real. They wouldn't. They wouldn't buy a new piece of equipment to use things. So we have worked hard on making sure our products uh, integrate with what most farmers are doing today. Uh, we don't want to ask you to do a, a whole lot special to be able to use that. And probably the lead on all those things, but it, it's last on the list, is it needs to return on investment. And that starts with us for the grower. If the grower doesn't return on that investment that he makes when he or she buys product, then I don't expect them to buy it again. I have an expectation that you have a return that you can see. Now, whether that's cash or whether that's soil improvements, or uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't put the barriers around that, but the grower needs to see that return on investment. And then we have to figure out how we distribute, manufacture and make our profit. Uh, Strategic direction in the company. This is just a, a list of things I've already mentioned. Uh, there is, uh, we spend a lot of effort on working with what's nitrogen fixing bacteria. Uh, there are many different time, uh, types. The, many of them are leguminous. In other words, they're the ones that will make nodules on plants and interact with peas, but lupins, there are woody plants that have nodules. Uh, from different types of bacteria and actinomycetes. So, uh, and one of the areas that probably has had most attention lately uh, is the non-leguminous. And, uh, you know, there are, there are other companies' products out there. I don't necessarily, uh, you know, you can ask questions that we can try to answer at the end. But really, this is where I believe the the true power of the ability of bacteria to convert that atmospheric nitrogen to a useful compound for plants. This is where we're gonna see impact. This is gonna have impact not only on, uh, particularly I should say, on uh, nitrogen availability to the plants. And, and uh, I am not, and the company is not against applied nitrogen. We need to use tools as they are presented to us. However, I don't think I need to tell anybody what happened to the price of applied nitrogen over the last couple of years. And if you know, we have developed alternatives to that, and just from a price point, I think they're useful. I believe they're also going to be very useful and are very useful in things like regenerative agriculture. Uh, and I fully expect in the years to come that as we get better and develop better products and characterize our current products better, that we will see more people shift to that away from applied. Uh, there's also a whole nother category, nutrient availability. Uh, phosphorus, I will talk about more today, but we have active research programs also 
on iron and potassium and other elements, uh, mineral nutrition that are important for plants and necessary for plant growth and to drive those yields. Now, I've already mentioned the biocontrol opportunities. I've listed a couple that are, that are there. We are not going to cover those today, but I wanted to give you a feel for the breadth and scope of what the company is doing. Uh, a little bit about the stabilization technology. I, I often get asked the very direct question, tell me what it is. And I can tell you that I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is. Uh, this is covered by uh, intellectual property laws, trade secrets, and I, we don't need to get into that discussion today. But I can tell you what I've got on this slide, for example. It is a multi-stage process. Uh, it involves how you grow the microbes. It also involves formulation. So what you put the microbes in, uh, you know, these, these are a couple of different components of that. We have found over the years that as we've done that, what we have done is reliably improve our shelf life. So our ability, the ability for our products to sit in a container from the manufacturing through the distribution through use uh, is very good. We, we set an arbitrary limit of two years. Um, this covers two growing seasons. I always get asked if we can extend that. Uh, the short answer is there are certain microbes where it's longer. And there are certain microbes where it's shorter. We're very comfortable with our shelf life as we have called it out. Uh, part of how that plays out is that process, that stabilization, gives us better survival under some of the more challenging uh, conditions. Uh, temperature, some temperature swings. We, we are able to uh, survive freeze thaw of our commercial products. Uh, we are in container types that the industry will, some in the industry will tell you don't support bacterial life. We've shown that. Uh, we have very good compatibility with existing agrochemicals, including seed treatments. Uh, so this encompasses tank mixing. Uh, probably one of the ones that, that uh, People, I don't want to say they're shocked, but opens their eyes. We have tank mix compatibility with 1034-0. 1034-0 is a fairly harsh fertilizer from a microbial standpoint. So uh, that we have a tank mix uh, compatibility, six hours, which seems short, but should be enough, uh, with that kind of chemistry is an indication of what stabilization can do. Uh, and then we, we found that uh, no surprise in life, uh, one size doesn't fit all, that we've had to make certain modifications to accommodate certain microorganisms. And we have done that. Uh, just a quick slide on, on some of the impact. Uh, this is azospirillum. This was uh, six different types of turf grass seed. Uh, seven months after they were treated, no special storage. Uh, and there are the CFUs and you're recording this. So I'm not going to walk through this list, but you can see on the left, uh, we use independent laboratories to, to test. Uh, we do this work also in our own laboratory but in terms of things that we like to present to the public, we like to have independent laboratory verification of what we say. And that's all these numbers come from an independent laboratory. Uh, they represent uh, turf grass seeds, by the way, of everything from Kentucky bluegrass to fescue. Uh, there's Bermuda grass in there as well. So there's a number of different types and sizes and of seeds. So. Um, now uh, let's, let's shift a little bit to soils and microorganisms. That's a very, very big name. I got just a couple of topics I wanted to cover within that. Uh, this is a picture of a rock wall on the Mississippi River, uh, just south of 494, if you're familiar with where 494 crosses. 
And uh, I show this for a very particular reason. You see green and growing plants. Nobody fertilizes those plants. There is no applied fertility to these plants. That is a rock wall. The nutrition necessary to drive that plant growth is coming uh, largely completely from the action of microorganisms. So different bacteria are on that wall, in that wall, associated with those roots of plants. They are bringing the mineral nutrition to those plants. And there is also nitrogen fixing bacteria mixed in there. And so these are not new concepts. You'll hear me say this a couple of times. You can look at these and, and, and uh, intuitively know that nature is, is providing nutrition via the action of microorganisms. So uh, this is a very real phenomena, been around a long, long time. It's our job to figure out how to do it, harness it, and apply it to our own needs. Uh, microbes are also very intimately involved in soil structure. And so this is just a, a cartoon, if you will, of a soil aggregate and how different parts of the uh, uh, you know, different parts of the soil particle actually get glued together and pulled together. Fungal hyphae, uh, uh, EPS, extracellular polysaccharides, think of it as glue. I'm sure most people have heard of glomulin. Uh, and that's also a compound that gets exuded that helps hold those things together for water stable soil aggregation. Uh, very important concept. Uh, and and I, we will know more about this in 10 years about how to better build those. Your cover crop approaches are excellent for that. They contribute to this kind of soil structure. Uh, uh, approach. And, and this is the type of situation where if you're thinking about, uh, you know, maximizing your operations ability, your soils op abil uh, uh, ability to provide drainage, uh, adequate moisture, uh, better contact, uh, a better transfer of that, the nutrition, whether applied or from microorganisms, this kind of concept is very important and how well that will play out. Uh, this is just a picture out of an old textbook of mine, uh, Modern Corn Production. Uh, back when I studied and used it, it might, it might have been edition one and they're probably on edition 10. That's a very common phrase that I can use. Uh, but I guarantee you microbes don't look like those cartoons. They don't hold spoons. But the real important part of this slide is that turnover, that activity, that ability of a microorganism or groups of microorganisms to be able to, if you will, recycle the organic matter, the residues, the plant residues, and turn them into organic matter and turn them into humus. And as you look at the slide, you see one ton of corn stalks, uh, it leaves and cobs, you're going to produce about 100 pounds of humus, which contains about 5% nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, other nutrition is in there as well. So this is a critical piece of understanding, not only in terms of soils, you build those soils, but as you're building those soils, you're also impacting the availability uh, in, in, in a way, ability of that soil to provide nutrition to the new growing plants. So um, I, I like to keep that in there. And uh, I wanna touch on uh, fertility cycles, uh, particularly in regard to nitrogen, but many of these compounds, uh, elements that we are interested in uh, have cycles and they go through natural geochemical cycles and uh, phosphorus cycle 
uh, you know, and, and we do not have microorganisms that will synthesize phosphorus. This will be very different from nitrogen when I talk about nitrogen. However, what we do have is lots of microorganisms that facilitate the transfer, if you will, from these different uh, types of holding areas. Uh, fertilizer and manure, you can see there. Uh, dairy manure, a very rich source of phosphorus. In fact, so much so that uh, I'm sure some of you have manure management plans and are limited in the amount of manure that you may be able to put on your ground. So it's just about how microbes help move these things through that cycle. And what we accomplish and hope to improve on is the ability to help them get to that part in the cycle where they're used in plant growth. So uh, again, I think key take homes here, it's not synthesized in the phosphorus cycle. Bacteria don't do that. What they do is help move it along and put it into certain types of uh, formats, if you will. A uh, little bit on the nitrogen cycle. Again, most people have seen this. Uh, this is uh, both for phosphorus and nitrogen, by the way, these kind of uh, uh, cartoons are boon and bane to me. Uh, it's very good that these cycles occur, that we can access them for our, our efforts at growing plants and driving yields. Uh, but they also then create problems with leaching or runoff uh, and the impact on waterways and such. So um, to me, this falls under the, you need to use every tool as wisely as you can. So, uh, but this is a process that, that exists and uh, we will concentrate more on the conversion of that gaseous atmospheric nitrogen up on the top of the screen and converting that to ammonium. Uh, some of the sources of nitrogen, um, and again, I'm hoping I'm hitting some hot spots for people. Uh, I, nev I never know for sure how deep to take people on these things. Uh, there are the non-biological, and most of us are aware of the Haber-Bosch process, which is the industrial process for providing uh, nitrogen. And it literally is the chemical fixing of nitrogen in this process that's going on. Uh, about uh, 50 million metric tons per year are produced by that. Uh, this is the stuff that, that the price fluctuates on, guys. The, uh, and uh, yeah, so, but combustion also will produce it. Lightning will produce it. Uh, if you've ever believed you've seen the grass greener after a thunderstorm, you're, you're not fooling yourself. If there was lightning in that thunderstorm, there was fixed nitrogen and that comes down and helps be applied to the plant. Um, I, I have literally seen products being sold to farmers that claim to attract lightning to their land. Um, I would tell you that's not an avenue we would choose. <laughs> so, um, but there's, there's a lot of nitrogen and remember, this is all part of that nitrogen cycle. Now, in terms of biological nitrogen fixation, you see the numbers there. Uh, it's happening on basically every surface uh, internally as well. I don't mean to say on the surface of soil, but agricultural land, forest land, non-agricultural land, think pasture, uh, think desert, as a matter of fact. Uh, the late Yoav Bashan showed azospirillum existed with cactus out in the desert. So the very, very ubiquitous phenomena, uh, they exist in the ocean and uh, more than double the amount of nitrogen in our nitrogen cycle comes from these biological processes, okay? And that's important to, to I think, understand because the opportunity to manipulate these systems may be there for us, whether it's manipulation of the microorganisms or manipulation of how we handle our land uh, to improve and enhance those opportunities, that opportunity is there for us. Um, uh, a science slide, again, I, I apologize, but BNF, biological nitrogen fixation, 
is a process that is utilized by the microorganisms. And I really want to make two points here. It's enzymatic, so it's driven by the machinery inside the bacteria. And the, uh, I think a very important part in this is that you'll see the green and red highlighted areas down in that formula. Don't memorize the formula, guys. Uh, but to produce two molecules of ammonia, you a, a bacterial cell for every two molecules of that uses 16 units of ATP. That's the energy providing part in a cell. That is a very expensive equation for a nitrogen fixing microorganism. In other words, it costs the cell an awful lot. Uh, this may color some of the successes of uh, some of our competitors, I believe, that, that you can't just break the switch that turns that process off because the, the, the bacteria become weaker. And uh, so, but that, that's a, there are different philosophies on how to do this. The point is that for a nitrogen fixing bacteria, they don't just get it for free they spend a lot of energy and a lot of cost on that energy to do this job. As a consequence of that, um, most nitrogen fixing microorganisms are very effective scavengers for nitrogen in the soil. And uh, you will see this uh, particularly in production systems. I've seen it many times where, where uh, guys have applied nitrogen to their soybean field at planting. And you know, there's no exact number, but let's say 90 units of N. If they put down 90 units of N, you will have green growing plants and they'll look healthy. And if you dig down, you will not find nodules on those roots. And we describe that as the bacteria is lazy. They're getting all the nitrogen they need from uh, the soil already applied. So. Uh, a little bit more specifically on bradyrhizobium and rhizobium generally. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to learn these names, guys. The taxonomists, the people who are responsible for naming these things, uh, are, are always learning. And as a consequence of that, they're always changing the name. Bradyrhizobium at one time was rhizobium japonicum. Uh, so this is just a, a cartoon about nodulation. Uh, that the bacteria interacts with the root. It is a two-way street. The plant interacts with the bacteria at the root hair, and that's what will form the nodule. And then when you form that nodule, the bacterioids are inside, and that's where you'll start to fix nitrogen. The, you'll see that it's colored red, the little circle with the red in the, in the middle. Uh, that indicates nitrogen fixation. Um, and that's a compound that the, the plant produces in response to that. Uh, there's cut nodules at the bottom of this. Uh, if you ever want to know if your nodules in whatever leguminous system you're growing in, if they are actively fixing nitrogen, dig up a couple of nodules, a couple of roots, squish them. If they show pink or red, they're active. Um, and, and I will spare you the, the talk about the compounds that are produced. Uh, and, and it's just, you know, some of this is, again, direct observation things. If your plants are growing well, they're deep green in color, they're getting a nitrogen. They're getting enough nitrogen. So um, to, to switch gears, this is azospirillum. And azospirillum does not form nodules. It does not have that kind of interaction with the plant. Uh, however, it does reside right at that root soil surface, okay? And in fact, azospirillum has the ability to produce a structure that holds it in place at that root. And I have a picture for that. So, um, this causes us some, some things to, gives us some things to think about, uh, including azospirillum is, is providing nitrogen, but there's no direct con uh, connection. And if you think about that nodule, that is a direct connection to, uh, 
to the plant. And that is a transport. We don't have the same thing in, in azospirillum, but it does provide nitrogen to the plant. We have had uh, a numerous uh, type of experiments that show that that, that product does that. Uh, this is the electrophotomicrographs I was talking about. RH stands for the root hair. That's the site of activity for azospirillum, the preferred site. That's where you're going to find most of them. You can see these elongated structures. So the RS is the root surface. And then the arrows are pointing to the structure that anchors that azospirillum to the root. And the kind of uh, corn dog shaped thing is the actual bacteria. So not all of the bacteria, not all of the azospirillum will attach and take this shape, but it is very common. So again, very different from the nodulation part of that. Here's just a couple of shots. Uh, uh, of azospirillum brazilance, which is one of the species we use. You can see it's kind of got this bright orange reddish color. Uh, it makes it a very easy bacteria to work with and count. And that's basically what we're doing in these two sets of Petri plates is we're, we're counting the left-hand side is where the lines are is dilution. Then the one that looks like a, a poorly cut pie we're actually assessing how many things are living in product. So this is part of our QAQC process as well. Um, but I think a greater point to make with this slide is it's very difficult to work with things if you can't see them. So the techniques of how to grow these things and visualize them uh, are very, very important for us and others. Uh, we're kind of moving along, I hope well enough. Uh, I'm going to speed up just a touch. Uh, this is phosphorus, uh, the product designed for pro phosphorus. Um, we are very well aware that in nature this occurs um, and, and is driven by different types of microorganisms. Um, endomycorrhizae are fairly well known for their ability to, to solubilize and transport phosphorus. Other fungi as well. There are other commercial products that utilize that. Uh, there are other bacterial products that utilize that as well. And uh, so the ability to use these things to either more efficiently utilize applied phosphorus or tap into the inherent phosphorus in soils uh, is where we see its ability. We have Two different uh, uh, genre uh, uh, types, if you will, of bacteria that we're using for phosphorus movement solubilization. Uh, we have a, a, some pseudomonads, a pseudomonas species, and then we have the Pantoya species. So uh, they do that. And again, this picture look, should look very familiar to the azospirillum picture. They do not form nodules. They interact around, at and around the root surface. Uh, and, and phosphorus solubilizers are probably active throughout the, the, the rhizosphere or the plant root soil zone. So they, they use various chemical cues to free up phosphorus. They use various chemical cues to protect and help move that phosphorus and keep it available to plants. And, and that's what this cartoon hopefully is showing. In the laboratory, we utilize again the Petri plate. You can see the small flecks uh, of things. That is tricalcium phosphate or calcium apatite. Uh, that is a very common source uh, a compound in the soils and uh, of phosphorus and of calcium, <clears throat> excuse me. And what we can literally do, you'll see the larger black dots on this, and I'm pointing at my slide as if you can see me point at the slide, I apologize. The larger black dots separated by those lines are different types of bacteria. And we literally look at them and say, okay, this is cleared. This has dissolved all those smaller particles. This one is a much better phosphorus solubilizer than the, its next door neighbor. And it gets more complex. You got to look at those different, different types of morphologies, different types of bacteria, how well they grow. But that basically is, is our biggest way to tell, the easiest way to tell if you can solubilize phosphorus. 
we are do more stringent testing. We use uh, spectrophotometers to actually determine quantities and, and such. So, uh, and on the right hand side is just kind of the the list of things that you need to do to make the grade, uh, to make the cut, if you will, to be used in our products. So. Uh, I want to end with a couple of comments on the RhizoFixer Plus uh, products. Uh, these are mixtures of different types of bacteria. I haven't shown you our laboratory data or field data that says we do know how to do this, but we do know how to keep these things alive together and in, uh, in the right proportions and concentrations. Uh, and, and we practice quality control and quality assurance for, for all of our products. We are a manufacturing outfit as well as a science outfit. So in what, uh, what Keith uh, wanted us to do, and I believe we've done, we've done the warm season blend. So there's different types. You see Bradyrhizobium japonicum, which is a very specific bacteria for soybeans. But then you get this Bradyrhizobium SPP, which is fairly uncharacterized, which is useful for cowpea and will interact with cowpea. And then you see the azospirillum and rhizobium leguminoserum is the bacteria that will interact with field peas. Uh, the cool season grass, uh, the cool season rhizofixer plus is a more truncated version of that. We have the field peas and, and we all know that field peas are a cool season crop. We have the azospirillum brazilense, and a, a quick word on that, azospirillum interacts with a lot of different plant species. Originally, it was thought to interact almost exclusively with grasses, but uh, we've shown and many other people have shown uh, that that is not true. We have positive results for canola, uh, one that none of us are going to grow in the Midwest, date palms, among others. Uh, so it has a very broad range of interaction. That's the same concept for Pseudomonas and Pantoia. They have a very broad range. Their interaction isn't restricted to a, a single type of plant, if you will. Where the Rhizobium leguminoserum, that's going to interact mainly with field peas and do its thing with field peas. So um, with that, I believe I've gone about a little over a half hour or more. Uh, I want to open it up for questions. And again, I want to thank everyone for their attention. And I do hope I've touched some topics for you. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, looks like we do have a, a couple of questions coming in. Um, what is the process for confirmation that the NFBs work with a given crop? Uh, there, are, there are a couple of different levels of stringency. I work backwards often for that, and that is impact in the field, okay? Uh, in other words, we put our products together to help you increase your yields, and that's one of the first things we measure. Did we help a farmer increase his yields in that? So that quite simply is a very a gross observation, if you will, on, on how to do that. Uh, we do have other techniques. There's a technique, uh, class of techniques called N15. It looks at the natural isotopic variation of nitrogen. It's a way to tell if you have taken nitrogen from the air and converted it to ammonia, and you look at the, the ratio of those isotopes. Uh, but there are other ways and other, other type of systems we've used. You can look at protein deposition. We've seen increased protein deposition in, in many different systems, uh, most reliably, I think, in wheat, but we've seen it, in, it of all things, in corn. Uh, I didn't personally think that was possible. So there are a number of different types of technologies we can use to access that, uh, uh, to generate that kind of answer, and we use them all. Okay. What is a cost-effective way to add nitrogen in the soil? I don't know if they're... Uh, oh, oh, maybe maybe what they're asking is, is how you handle the soils. Um, it, if that's it, I'm going to tell you that, that it is just following uh, as well as you can, guys. I know that. I can sit here in my at my desk and tell you what you should do. 
then nature gets involved and it rains, right? And you need to get out in the field and you compact your soils. So those are some of the things you got to pay attention to. Compaction is not the friend of microbial aerobic uh, 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 activity of microbes. So you want to pay attention to that. How well cover crops could be a very big and are a very big part of that picture. You want to integrate them. Are you using them as green manures? Uh, those are ways to improve soil. So I look at it in two kind of big categories. Number one is you want to minimize the negative things, you know, don't work wet soils, or those kind of issues. You want to minimize those as well as you can. And then you want to improve at things such as uh, how you recycle your plant residue, you know, whether or not your no-till uh, and how, how you can encourage those soil structural aspects, which are usually relate to how well and how much uh, native microbes can help you provide nitrogen for your plants. Okay. I've heard that phosphorus solubilizing bacteria stimulate NFB. How does that work? Also, does PSBs use an enzyme called phosph phosphatase? Uh, Let's, let's take those backwards. Uh, yeah, phosphatase is an enzyme that is produced by microorganisms. Uh, typically, the, not typically, pho what phosphatases do is, is they go after what, what's called the organic sources of phosphorus. So think about phosphorus that gets put into plant parts and plant residue and, and thus has that organic uh, a th a manure also would be a source of that. And much of that phosphorus can be liberated when you use the enzyme system phosphatase, okay? Uh, in our research, we've found that, that we can de we've designed systems to go after the inorganic or the phosphorus on particles, et cetera, mm -hmm. and that it works for both. So, but both exist, and, and I want to make sure that we, uh, we cover that. Uh, remind me of the first part of the question, please, Dylan. The first part was, I've heard that phosphorus solubilizing back bacteria stimulate NFB. How does that work? Yeah, and there are a lot of things that I wish we had the answer to in the microbiome. There are unquestionably uh, ways that these bacteria encourage and stimulate each other, just as there are ways that they are detrimental to each other. Typically when they stimulate, it's either by the production of chemical compounds and most likely is that it's freeing up and providing nutrition to the other microbes. So that is more likely the case. Um, okay. Uh, next question. I can broadcast seed and supplements. Are these going to survive on the soil surface? Uh, stabilization has provided uh, an avenue to be able to do that. Let me explain a little bit, hopefully quickly. Uh, we uh, have a azosporillum product line that we have we've sell into turf grass, not necessarily under our brand name, uh, although we have that. Uh, and that is a broadcast application. Now we encourage them not to leave it lay on the ground for days at a time. So how you would address that in farming would be use, use more water on application or more fluid if you're doing a, a, a fertility application. Uh, in turf grass, we encourage them to, where they have sprinklers, literally turn on the sprinklers. Turf grass situations typically will use 50 to 100 gallons in many times of water as their delivery agent anyways. As the, but I, I'm not about to stand in a group of farmers and say, you gotta buy three more tanker trucks. <laughs> We've found that we can get by with about two to five gallons and get it into that soil profile. That is important. Uh, so they, I don't want them just laying on the, on the surface, but they will have a survival profile. Um, okay. How do you confirm that the microbes you put in your products will grow well in the grower's ecosystem? Have you found that your microbes go, grow well everywhere across the country? 
Uh, that would be more belief than 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 proven. Uh, but we we have used our products in across the gamut from uh, from California and their highly calcareous soils. Uh, you know, to the East Coast and, and uh, every soil type in between. Uh, in fact, we had, and I did not present this data, but we had an analysis done by somebody who was partnering with us called a meta-analysis. And I, I got to be really honest, guys. I don't know that I believe what I'm going to tell you, but their analysis was that soil type did not play a statistically significant role in the impact of the microbe in the life of the microbe. So um, I, I, I guess I need more proof of that, even though I have proof of that, again, in the, in the different soil types and environments that we've used them in and that other people have used them in. Okay. Does your nitrogen fixing bacteria formulation change season to season? If so, how should I judge applicability, applicability ability of performance trials for future seasons? Our formulations do not change season to season. Uh, we continually work on how do we bring additional nitrogen fixing microorganisms in to the mix. There are many different types. There are types of nitrogen fixing microorganisms that grow inside the plant. Uh, and do their job there. Uh, there are ones like azospirillum that grow right next to the plant or in very close proximity to the plant and provide their nitrogen by growing there. There are also other ones such as azotobacter that tend to grow out just out in the environment. So uh, we approach the, the concept of amping up our products more by how do we utilize those other things. We don't really see the seasonal vary the need for seasonal formulation for those. Cool season, uh, cool season, warm season, that's linked to plant species more than environment. Um, but once you get the bacteria there, if you've kept them alive, if you've kept them in fit condition, they will do the jobs that they're capable of. And that's what we have seen over 25 years. Okay. Do these organisms persist in the soil or is it necessary to reapply yearly? Well, that's, that's a boon and bane question again. And as the manufacturer, I think it's more boon <laughs> because uh, the microbiome in, in almost all soils that I've been acquainted with and, and read about studied uh, tends to be very difficult to shift. And what that means is you can dump an awful lot of stuff on there and you may find some of it, but it's gonna be at low background levels. Essentially, that's what it means. So the microbiome is pretty well buffered in how complex it is. And, and that's unfortunate for farmers. Uh, you actually, I think, would get more bang for the buck paying attention to your soil structural uh, type of issues in building that up and that would aid it. Uh, but currently, I'll tell you that they do not persist in the environment. Uh, there are some exceptions, but it does relate to population level and effectiveness. Do you have any products for organic cotton? Well, we've had some guys working with uh, azospirillum on cotton, and we are able to be able to put all of, currently, all of our microbial products into organically approvable format. Uh, over the last 17 years, we have worked not with Omri, but directly with certification agencies. Uh, I believe we've built a very good rapport and reputation uh, with them. So uh, the organic part of that equation doesn't phase me. Uh, we have seen some very interesting things in cotton. And uh, uh, please get a hold of Dylan and Keith and the, and the guys and us so we can... Uh, help you with that. And I'll share that data set as well, those data sets. Okay. Uh, can we use your products to inoculate our own compost and, ex and apply extracts later? Uh, 
people have tried. I don't think that's a very a good avenue. There's pH issues, so acidity, uh, basic problems with some composts, and and it they compost to be effective in compost tea have certain types of microorganisms uh, like streptomycetes, trichoderma, uh, that tend to, um, I, I don't know if dominate is the right word, but they're certainly within that mix and they have an impact on survivability. Uh, the example of that is streptomycetes, they produce antibiotics, which directly inhibit other bacteria. So um, I'm not aware of anybody who has cracked that. We haven't put a lot of effort into it personally. Okay. Uh, that maybe kind of leads into this question a little bit. What role does pH play on the efficacy, soil pH play on the efficacy of your biological products? Uh, happy to say you've given me an opportunity to crow a little bit. Uh, that in our stabilization, our bacteria are less uh subject to pH and, and get the job done. Once they get established by the plant, they're, they're, they're doing their thing. Uh, now we have seen increased response with increased application. So that's an indication, but pH is a way that, uh, again, when you ask the question about establishing in the microbiome, pH is going to govern who dominates and who falls by the wayside on that. Classically, nitrogen fixing bacteria and microorganisms really do best at a six to eight pH. I can tell you again that based on our analysis of our work, that that's a much broader pH when you're talking about soils. And, and it's a different question to ask if your product is effective than to ask, are you establishing your bacteria in the soils? So. Okay. Um, says you mentioned Teramax is starting to look more at biological control. Are you looking at potential of biological control of insects? Some regen ag leaders have promoted that a healthy soil microbial community can improve plant health to the point that it provides a biocontrol mechanism against insects. Is there truth to this claim? There is some truth to that claim, but there, there, what happens is when things are fuzzy or not very well known, or we haven't made that direct science link to it, uh, you know, people will interpret it in a number of different ways. Uh, to healthy soils, hands down, better tilth, better operation of the soils will also provide a better buffer to insect and disease situations. Part of that is they don't necessarily always get a chance to uh, be there uh, in populations enough to be economically important. Um, so, uh, but we, we have, <clears throat> in fact, the first product I put together at Terramax was a, a soybean cyst nematode control product. Um, and, and I'm not crying guys, but uh, uh, I learned early on in the Terramax life that, uh, I didn't have the money or patience to deal with the EPA. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to say that we're in a different position as a company. We have rekindled our efforts to register that product for soybean cyst nematode control. We have also worked with uh, antifungal mixtures. Uh, this was for a researcher out at Oregon State University, Cindy Oakham. Uh, and and uh, so there is, uh, she had a mixture that we were showing were effective against various types of fusarium, very important pathogen. Uh, so yes, we are active and we're going after some of the, some of the targets we see in biocontrol, but a healthy soil guys, we cannot repeat enough that do the things that you can afford to do to improve your soil structure and its operational capabilities. Okay. Uh, we still have a few more questions here. So if, I mean, if it's all right with you, Doug, we may go over a little over one, if that's good with that's you. That's fine, that's fine. Um, I've heard that the soil EC levels are critical to microbes survival. Is this true? Uh, that's a, uh, 
Yeah, it uh, it can be critical. Are, are are they asking about saline and sodic levels of soil? Uh, I'm guessing maybe the, I'm thinking that must be the electric conductivity of that, the soil. That's the saline and sodic nature of soils. Yes, they can have a direct impact on survival of microorganisms. Uh, you know, you can you can see this, uh, and you don't have to go all the way to California and the West Coast, guys. North Dakota has, at last I knew, 12 million acres of saline and sodic impacted soils. That sets up nutritional gradients and osmotic gradients and all kinds of different big word thing gradients that directly impact the ability of microbes to thrive. Okay. Uh, however, I'm going to tell you that microbes are very adaptable and, uh, and they're, they're, you know, in our lifetime, they may not come to where they're, they're not bothered by those. They're, they're currently, yes, EC would be a consideration for a healthy soil from a microbial perspective. Is there a, a range or like a, a scale that, that would be involved with that? Uh, not that I could give you with any confidence today, but let me look it up and I'll ship it to you so you can get that to the, the questioner. Because um, I, I do like to have solid pieces of data, but I don't like to just try to remember them. <laughs> Good. Uh, are there biologicals that would not be compatible in a slurry used for seed treatment ahead of planting? Adding vermi vermiliquid, for example. Uh, which which liquid? Uh, vermiliquid. So I'm guessing. Ah, vermicompost. Yeah. Yes, there are microbes that will not be compatible. Uh, I talked a little bit about streptomycetes and their production of antibiotics. That's one of the direct avenues with that. Uh, uh, vermicomposting is very interesting. And, and for the folks that I know that have used that system, and in fact, I know a guy who, who is involved in its production, uh, there, I wouldn't expect, uh, I would want to do the laboratory bench test to test compatibility. There are lots of different things to choose from. They can be byproducts, you know, things that may negatively impact. Uh, again, I mentioned the antibiotics, but there are also other things. There could be pH considerations with, with some of those situations as well. Um, but, but by and large, I'm, I'm, I, I wish we could have larger scale operations for some of those because I think the vermicomposting has, has some really interesting things about it. Okay, um, this one, uh, she's, uh, there's, uh, he's stating, uh, I'm about to start a monarch habitat and will be applying a heavy load of limestone as my pH balance is low. I will be doing it soon. Will this have an effect? Not on the microbes, not on the inoculants. Again, they're, they're pretty well buffered. Once, once they start to interact with the plant, our job is to make sure they're alive as that so you can do that, um, and and so that I would not uh, I would not expect to see problems with that. Okay. Do you have a nitrogen fixing solution for grasses and pastures, or do the products we've talked about today maybe help out with that? They they do. They will interact with uh, grasses and pastures. The azospirillum, uh, uh, if you will, that was its sweet spot. Uh, and uh, some of the small looks we've taken, uh, we get establishment and impact. Um, I'd love, I have to say it that way because we just haven't done a lot of work on that. I think formulation of the product is probably maybe a bigger hurdle. In other words, we have the liquid and we have the dry seed applied. Uh, and I think that in pasture grasses, you might want to have a granule, and we don't have a granule yet. We've done work. I think we could put it into play. Um, I'm confident of its stability. In other words, its survival characteristics. But I think that would be the way to approach pastures. Uh, but I'm open to people's comments on that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, looks like maybe we have a couple more questions here. Um, what are the chemical cues that PSBs use to solubilize soil phosphorus? 
Uh, great question. I don't know that I'm qualified to answer it precisely. Uh, a lot of what drives these functions in bacteria, be it phosphorus or other specific uh, elements, where, like I mentioned, we're looking at potassium. They're because the, the microorganism is hungry. <laughs> so the microorganism is searching for food and it produces things like organic acids, uh, siderophores, among other types of compounds. They're currently, they're, they're kind of labeled small molecule compounds. Uh, these are things that the microbe itself produces to feed itself. So that, that's basically the driver in that. Okay. Uh, I think we got two more questions here and I think then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, what practices are you referring to to improve soil structure? We're no-till already. And I, I think you alluded to that with cover crops a little bit earlier, but maybe there's some. Uh, yeah, cover crops would be really for a no-till operation. That's, that's one of your best. Uh, and again, that's on that positive side of the spectrum. On the negative side of the spectrum, you really want to pay attention to to when you're working the soil and the condition of the soil with that, and particularly with moisture. I would refer everyone, Ohio State University, I think about 15 years plus ago, did a very, very good study on compaction and its impact on yield in corn. But I think we can glean a lot of information from that. So you want to limit those negative uh, uh, impacts and you want to, and cover crops in a no-till is great. And if you're in a situation where you can encourage worm uh, activity, uh, and I'm no expert on worm activity, uh, but that's the kind of thing. In no-till that I've seen that is very successful in generating tilth in a appreciable amount of the profile, in other words, below four to six inches, uh, there has always been a, a lot of worm activity. And they're pulling down the plant residue. So they're pulling that, that lunch line down to the microbes that are there. And so that's one way to visualize that. So that's, a, that's about what I have there. Thanks. Wish I had more. Last question here. Uh, how does prescribed fires affect microbes? Very little other than altering food source and altering the amount of food source. In other words, um, they're going to be, uh, you know, most microorganisms have uh, stable resting structures, spores, uh, cysts, uh, those kind of structures. There aren't many of them like azospirillum uh, that have a couple of different mechanisms included how many of them can get together. So there's a quorum kind of issue. Uh, but th they have these uh, capabilities uh, to survive those kind of events. Uh, particularly, fire is mainly a surface event. So in the soils, you're going to have a more protected... Uh, think about how you see seeds sprout after a fire goes through. You know, those are larger biological systems that survive that. Microbes are going to survive that as well. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, Doug, I want to thank you on behalf of Green Cover. We really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to uh, talk to us and our, our, our customers a little bit more about the Terramax product. Um, and I want to thank everybody else for attending today and would like to make sure uh, next week we will be uh, same time on Wednesday at noon. Uh, we'll be visiting with Jay Young, uh, who is a farmer in Southwest Kansas and his um, use of the Johnson Sioux bioreactor bio and how to build it and how to extract it to use it on your own operation. So with that, Doug, thank you and everybody have a great day.